Good morning, everyone. My name is Wilma Holly. I am the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program Specialist. And this is one of my favorite classes to teach, although I like the bird one quite a bit too. And some of you, if you've seen the bird one, you know there will be some of the same slides at the beginning and some of the plants are the same because pollinators and birds like some of the same plants, but then there's a lot more wildflowers and other plants on here that um, aren't on that one, especially because that one's just a native plant one. We'll go ahead and get started. Um, we're part of the University of Florida Extension and then part of Sarasota County and my program is Florida Friendly Landscaping. And just in case anybody's new to Zoom, um, you come in, we are muted when you come in. Um, then you can, uh, uh, if you need to make some changes or you can't hear us, you need to um, use this little knob here and up button and, and um, adjust your, your settings. Um, start or stop your video. Um, later on, when we get finished, if you want to ask questions, we can let you do that. And uh, that one I'm not familiar with. <laughs> um, if you want to see the participant list, you can click on that button. Chat button, that's where we ask you to put most of your questions at the beginning or throughout. And then um, if there's a lot of questions, um, I have Kevin helping me and he will let me know if there's a question as we're going along so it's relevant to the point where we're at in the thing. Um, and then if for some reason you need to leave, that's where you hit that. And the, um, we are recording this, so we'll send you the loop, or we'll, we'll send the whole participant list since some people couldn't make it, we'll send the YouTube link out afterwards. But it, it doesn't get up right away because there's, um, takes a little bit of time to get everything on there. Um, so Extension is a partnership between Sarasota County, the University of Florida, and the Department of Agriculture, USDA. Um, the university does the research and they have the resources. And then we reach out to people, our residents and our professionals, decision makers, to help people make better choices in their life and have a better future. Um, there's, we have a lot of initiatives going on, classes and outreach and volunteer opportunities. We have the Master Gardener program. Um, and these are all of what our extension office has, a couple of them, the chemicals in the environment, which is really chemicals not in the environment because she tries to keep them out, teach people better ways through um, integrated pest management to, to use less chemicals, but, um, and also waste reduction is one that's not in all the counties, but hopefully eventually those two are very, very important. They will be, but I'm under the residential horticulture program, um, Florida Friendly Landscaping, and then we have commercial horticulture for the landscapers, things like that. 4-H and youth development. I don't know if all of any of you were in 4-H when you were younger. I was, and um, I didn't know extension and all that was connected, and a lot of people still don't. So um, a lot of good programs that we have. And these are some of the things that each of those programs does. Um, sort of micro practice, microplastic awareness. Master Naturalists, Master Gardeners, um, Center for Landscape Conservation and Ecology, Florida Waters, Energy Upgrades, Sustainable Communities, Green Business. Our Waste Reduction um, Guy does that. And then we have Family Nutrition Program and Family and Consumer Sciences. So a lot going on out of our office. So the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program has these nine principles and with um, plants to attract pollinators, we're basically concerned with attracting wildlife because pollinators and butterflies and birds and those kinds of things are all wildlife. And then of course, if you don't manage your yard pests responsibly, you're not gonna get the pollinators in there because if you're spraying um, what, what I call willy-nilly, you, you just um, deter wildlife. You're not gonna have the pollinators. You can't spray every single bug you see because 99% of them are beneficial or harmless. There's only a small percentage, less than 1% that is, that is harmful that you would really need to spray and you can spot treat for those if you have to. Um, but these are all very much interrelated and um, as such, they're, they're very connected. 
So pollinators are extremely important. 75% um, of flowering plants depend on pollinators. And some plants are actually endangered because of the, the diminished pollination going on. And all, a lot of, because of the ecosystem collapsing without the pollinators, um, that's part of that diminished pollination and endangered species, plant species and animal species that that affects. There's over 100 U.S. crops that depend on animal pollination. And in your resources that I emailed you, there's actually a link to a couple of TED Talks. And one of them has a breakfast on the table. And they took away everything that depended on animal pollination. There was very food, little food left on that plate. So um, really, if we want to keep eating, we need to protect our, our pollinators. So one in every three to four bites of food. Most sources say three, but some say four. Um, the food depends on pollinators. Wildlife depends on pollinators. And to me, this bottom one's pretty darn important, the chocolate. I'm a chocoholic. Chocoholic and a plantaholic. So I need pollinators in a big way. So 1,200 crops worldwide. That's 35% of the crops. 96% of land birds need um, insects to feed their chicks. So when they're um, nesting, usually in the spring around our area, well, I guess around most areas, um, 45 million acres, of, they need the chick to feed, the insects to feed their chicks. So 45 million acres of lawn currently in the U.S., 70 million pounds of pesticides applied annually to the lawns. That's 10 times as much as used in farming. People like to blame farmers for a lot of our problems with pesticides and fertilizers, but way more goes into our lawns. And 800 million gallons of gas used annually by those lawnmowers. Um, and I did get that from Audubon. So here's a mockingbird with an insect. This was a, a picture that I took in the spring. The plant doesn't look too healthy, but um, that made me be able to see the bird better anyways. Um, and she was, this, this was a different nest. It wasn't her nest, but um, it, because it was two different years, but they do have to um, have insects when they're at this stage in the nest. Later on, as they get a little bit older, I, I like to call this one a teenager because he's still begging for food and he probably could, uh, and, I, and I don't know why I call it a boy because my brother always got extra food and, and um, he got two donuts and us girls only got one donut. So I'm calling him a boy. She's feeding him. He promptly, she gives him a berry. He promptly drops it. So the next one she stuffs down his throat so that he um, can't drop that one. She works too hard for her food. So. Um, the U.S. value of crop pollinators in, in 2010, I couldn't find an updated version of that. It got all wonky. They, there was like huge numbers and lower numbers, and, and I'm sure it's much, much higher now, but 29 billion, um, and that's all pollinators, not just bees. It's, it's the, the native bees. Um, the honeybees are not native, but there are a lot of native bees. There's over, over 600 species of bees in, in Florida alone. But if we could um, market pollinators as a public company, it would be worth between, for, this is in the global marketplace, between 235 billion and 577 billion worth. So that's, that's a pretty huge amount of um, contribution by pollinators. So the, some of the pollinators that we're gonna be talking about um, today, bees and wasps, beetles, butterflies, moths, and skippers, which are kind of all they, they're all Lepidoptera and they all are very similar in their needs. It's just that moths are more, more out at night, but not all of them and, and butterflies and skippers more usually in the daytime. And skippers are actually called butterflies as well. Bats, flies, and birds. Actually, we're talking more about plants, but this is just some of what you would see in your garden. Over 20,000 species of bees in the world 4,000 in North America, only 300 in Florida. I, I thought somewhere I had seen um, a higher number than that. And that varies depending on who's doing the research too. But hummingbirds are the most common one in our area in Sarasota. Um, if you would in the chat, put what county you're from, if you're from Florida, if you're from somewhere else, just put your state or your country. Um, we like to keep track of that. 
So in, in our area in Florida, and I know in northern Florida, they get several species of hummingbird, but we get mainly the ruby-throated here in, in Sarasota County. Um, they're attracted to a, a wide variety of shapes and colors. They don't just need red. In fact, in my yard, they always went to the um, fire bush first, and then the second plant they always went to was this necklace pod, which is yellow. So, but they do seem to go mainly to red, orange, and pink because they're the most visible, but depending on what, what you have in your yard. And a lot of the plants that are listed as really, really popular for hummingbirds are the red, the red plants. Fragrance isn't important to them and they eat often in large quantities and they also feed insects when they're, when they're feeding their young. Bats, there's more than 900 species, 1,300 of which reside in Florida. They generally feed at night. They like white or light flowers. Um, the pollen clings to their hairs. That's how they carry it from plant to plant. Um, some of the tropical fruits, I can't say that first word, so agave. Vegetables like banana, avocado, mango, and cashew. Seguero, I, I'm not sure. I think it's pronounced in way different than that. Uh, butterflies and moss. Um, most are very generalist as far as what they get their nectar from, but they are specialists for food for their larvae. They only lay the larvae on the plants that is a host plant for the larva, but they'll, they'll, go, they'll use almost anything for nectar sources. And they transfer the pollen on their wings and legs and um, scales when they nectar so that you'll see, sometimes you'll see a butterfly almost covered in nectar and that's when they go into a big flower and come back out, the nectar just sticks all over them. But a lot of times just on their proboscis. Butterflies are active during the day and they prefer bright colors. Moths active at night, which I mentioned in the pale flowers. It's polyphemus moth. A lot of people think moths aren't very pretty, but some of them, the luna moth is one, it's just absolutely gorgeous. But when you really look at the patterning on these and the eye spots, some of this is just, um, you know, to, to scare other predators off because if uh, something started to pick it up and they open those wings, um, that would maybe scare something thinking it's much bigger than it actually is. And if they did grab it, they would only get the tail end and not the front end. And you can see the caterpillar for this one, which is one that's non-specialist. I think this was on an oak tree when we found it. And then flies, they're also generalists, and some of them mimic bees. This one right here is a, uh, looks quite a bit like a bee or a wasp. Several are important pollinators. Um, goldenrod, pawpaw, members of the carrot family are some of the ones that they use. This um, plant here was saltbush, and um, that had flies all over it. It had a lot of other pollinators on it as well, but um, so they're very, very important as, as pollinators. And then beetles. They're the most diverse group of insects, but um, they sometimes um, eat as well as eat parts of the plant instead of just gathering pollen. So they, they can be destructive, but not all of them. Some of them are, are just gathering pollen. Um, they like white and green flowers with large openings and lots of pollen. This top one is a, a magnolia, and you can see there's several different beetles on there. And then things like magnolia, sweet shrub, and yellow pond lilies. This one on the bottom is a uh, rosin weed, so they, they do go to different, different ones. So when you start planting for pollinators, you kind of need to think about what, what you want to attract. Not so much with the pollinators as with butterflies. If you're trying to attract certain kinds of butterflies, you do need to have plants that the caterpillars are going to eat, but otherwise they're going to attract anything and poll pollinators in general are going to be attracted to most kinds of flowering plants. So flowers in general, people, people say, well, does that attract anything? And yeah, most flowers are going to attract some kind of pollinator because that's part of the life cycle of flowers is to attract pollinators. So different stages have different needs. This, this um, is a Gulf fritillary here on the right, and that's a Gulf fritillary caterpillar. And of course, down here on the bottom on the left <coughs> is a monarch, and those are monarch caterpillars. 
So all pollinators need food, water, space, and shelter. That's, that's their habitat. And <clears throat> animals, pollinators, um, will only reside or forage in an area that contains enough of these essential elements so that they can maintain their daily activities. They will go through pollinators, butterflies, they'll go through an area, but if it doesn't have the food or the shelter that they need to maintain, they're not gonna stay there for very long. So the object with planting for pollinators is to have enough in your yard where you also have some shelter, you have space, you have a water source for them, and, and of course the flowers, which would be the food because you want them to stay in your yard. So one of the biggest food considerations is reduction of the use of pesticide. Eliminate it entirely if possible. You, sometimes there's a little bit of spot treating that might be um, needing doing. Like in my yard, I do occasionally more on the house. I spray wasps because I have a tendency to get stung. And um, going in and out of the garage, they, they like to build uh, on the um, rail that where things open up. And um, if I don't know they're there and I'm going through, I, I get stung and I swell up so bad that I, I, I spray those. Um, but you also need volume and dependability of the food. You need a year round supply because they don't all go dormant in the winter. The, the, some plants go dormant and some insects um, hibernate, but a lot of them are out year round in our area of Florida. There's other areas where you don't have to have a year-round supply because you don't have the pollinators active in the winter. But, but here in South Central Florida, we do need a year-round supply. But taste and palatability, usually they'll find something they like. That, that is, um, you'll see certain plants that they just absolutely go hog wild over and other ones you don't see that many on. So if you're saying, well, I don't have room for anything and you've got a plant that they're not crazy about, then maybe get rid of that, that plant and plant something that they are crazy about. I've got a couple of plants in my yard right now that I'll probably get rid of eventually. Um, so you need the nectar for flowering plants and then you need the host plants for the larval if you're doing butterflies. So a little bit about um, the pesticides. The label is the law. If you do have to spray anything, residues can stay in the yard. You want to spot treat very, very carefully. Um, and, and the thing is, you non-target species can be affected. I, I like to show this picture because this reminds me of me when I was little. I was cute back then. Um, non-target species, that's a non-target species. That is not something that that person that sprang, probably her father, meant to, to to get in there, but there could be pesticides on that ball. But the same with, with um, ladybugs and, and insects that you want in your yard. You don't know what you're hitting. So if you're trying to have pollinators in your yard, pesticides is the last thing you want. I go to, on site visits um, to homeowners associations and places and they say, well, how come we don't see any birds anymore? I said, because you're spraying all the time and you don't have any insects and they have to have insects. Um, and also they, they have a tendency to, to plant very ornamental plants that don't get berries on them. So the, it just goes hand in hand. You're not gonna see birds where you don't have insects and seeds and, and fruit. Pollinators are very drastically in decline worldwide. So always, always on chemicals use the least toxic method first. And I just threw this in this morning because somebody post, posted it on Facebook. This is me. See, I told you I used to be cute, but I think everybody at that age was cute. But anyways, um, so integrated pest management, coordinated use of pests and environmental information, and then um, and the available pest control methods. But there's certain amounts of damage that we can accept. So we... we we can't just say, oh, I got a bug on my plant, I got to spray it. And I've known people in the past, and I probably many 20, 25 years ago, I might have been a little bit that way. I'm making amends now. Um, you, you just don't spray everything you see because there are so many beneficial insects out there that you would just be destroying everything. So you can accept some damage, even if it's a beetle eating some of your plants or a caterpillar eating some of your plants. 
caterpillars turn into butterflies and moths. And some, I had somebody ask me once because I had some caterpillars that they eat something I didn't want to be eaten. And it, it was to the point where there was enough that it would kill my bush. And um, they said, well, if you're attracting wildlife, that's one of your principles. How can you get rid of that caterpillar? And that, that made me stop and think because I was trying to attract pollinators and it not, I was more trying to attract butterflies, but then it's like, well, moths are important too. And um, when, if the plant is too small to survive the damage, then yes, you might have to get rid of some. But now if I see caterpillars, I'm like, oh, cool. You know, let them eat the plant because my plants are bigger now and they can handle that damage. Um, so you, so you got to stop and think about the damage that's acceptable to you. If it's a prized plant that you don't want any holes in or you're getting ready to take it to the fair to show or something, then you don't want any damage. But sometimes you can just pick the insects off, move them to another plant, depending on what it is. I mean, you're not going to be going around picking wasp off or something like that. But anyways, you want to use the product that is the least possible hazard to people, property, and the environment. And, and that's it in a nutshell. There's, I mean, we, we could talk about that for an hour, but we're not going to. But so the principles of pi, IPM, you really, really want to identify um, the problem first. You want to know what the insect is, and then maybe you can prevent it. Maybe you can use some cultural practices. There's biological methods that you can use, physical methods and chemical methods. And so down here in the center, those were IO caterpillars, which are a stinging caterpillar. But when they're young, most of, this, most of their life actually, they stay in a bunch and they eat the plant. And the damage that was already on this leaf was caused by a leaf um, cutter bee, which was taking pieces of leaf back to their um, nest to feed their young. A fungus grows on it and they take it back. So that wasn't enough damage for me to worry about. But since these stay in a bunch, there's my mouse. Um, they, they weren't really, they would eat one leaf and then they would go single file up to another leaf. If they were going to completely destroy the plant, I would have maybe gotten rid of them. But I wanted to catch the whole um, life cycle. So I, I just kept watching and waiting and, and actually every day or every few days, a couple times a week, another one would have disappeared. So when it got to the very last one, I was like, okay, I need to go pick one of those out. Well, you don't handle them with your hands because you would get stung and it's very, very painful. But I said, well, I need to go get one of those and, and bring it in so I can see the whole life cycle, the, the pupa and the moth when it hatches. But one by one, they got knocked off and I, like there was that one left. I'm like, okay, I'm going to get it. And it was gone. A wasp or something had killed it. So you just, you just have to watch the damage on the plant. If it's getting beyond where it's going to damage the plant beyond repair, then you would need to maybe, you know, in this case, you could have cut the whole leaf off. If you didn't want them growing or the plant was real little, you could just cut that leaf off, put it in some soapy water, and then, you know, then you're okay. In the case of this one over here, this is a ladybug larva on the right. And um, I've had <laughs> people... I've known people that have killed those because they thought they were harmful. So if you don't know what it is, you need to ask. Now on the left, those lovers, I've never known them to be anything good. So when they're at this stage, they're still all together. At that stage, you want to knock them into a bucket of soapy water. Sometimes at this stage, birds might eat them, but when they get bigger, they do a lot, a lot of damage to plants in the lily family. And then other plants too. Um, so you just you just need to um, know about plants and the cultural practice would be just picking these off, pick, picking a branch off. If you have aphids, they're always on the most tender growth. You can cut some of that off and then you, you don't have the damage. But you also the biological methods, wasps come in and um, parasitize them and then they take care of the problem themselves. So some of those things and you see down here at the bottom, the chemical method is the very, very last thing you would try. So when we spray for pests, we're also damaging these good guys. This is the only home we have, so we don't want to destroy it with chemicals. 
And so also for insects, you, it's always helpful to um, provide nesting opportunities, especially for some of the solitary bees. And these have to be a specific size. Um, you can cut blocks, um, holes in blocks of wood and use, use that. Um, but these, you can also purchase these and then they have paper liners, which then you can later pull out and just put new liners in so you keep them clean so there's not diseases developing in there and things like that. And the Xerces um, Society has a lot of, of um, well, you can, you can purchase these or, or they also have directions for doing your own. And also sometimes you need bare grounds for some of the ground nesting solitary bees. So always, always provide um, places for, for solitary bees and our native bees to, to be able to develop and grow. Um, here at work, this, this wasn't ours, this was from England, but we actually started one of these with one pallet and it was pretty cool. We had drilled, we had had our maintenance department drill some holes in some blocks of wood and we had straw in there to attract insects and we had a few other things. We had a school um, group help with it, but then our building got painted and it got knocked over and destroyed. So we don't have it anymore, but hopefully one day we'll build another one because it's really cool. I mean, lizards can go in here, ladybugs can hide in the winter, um, probably snakes would use it. And I know some of you don't want snakes, but they're, they're extremely beneficial for the environment. So a lot of good out of a, a habitat like this that you can create. So the water that you need to supply for, for insects, you can have um, these two butterflies are getting water and minerals from just a muddy area. There was a leaky faucet. This was up in Pinellas County when I was up there. There was a leaky faucet and they were getting minerals and water from the soil. But if you don't have a wet area in the ground, hopefully you don't have a leaky faucet because that wastes a little too much water. You can create a puddling station. You can put sand, um, a little bit of manure because they do need, especially the male butterflies do need some uh, minerals and then put a little bit of gravel on top and keep the level of water just above the gravel because they won't, um, bees and wasps and other insects won't be able to utilize it if there's deep water in there. I always bring it clear up to the top so they can use the top to stand on and they still get, and then some of the um, pieces that I have are sticking up above the, the level. And I see um, different insects using that. So Florida native plants versus non-native plants. Um, if a plant is beneficial to your habitat and and has some really good benefits to it for insects. Doesn't really matter if it's native or non-native. I have a tendency to lean towards native because I do notice in my yard that the insects go to my native plants first. However, there are a couple of non-native plants that they go to a lot. So um, it just depends on what you have. A lot of people say, well, the native plants aren't pretty, but there are some pretty darn pretty native plants. The problem is that some of them don't bloom year round, but if you hunt around, you can find some of those that do bloom year round too. But um, ur urban settings are getting pretty monotonous. You see the same plant. My um, former boss and I used to joke that we wouldn't even have to go on a site visit. We knew exactly what was going to be in an HOA, a homeowners association, because they all use the exact same palette of plants. Um, Arbicola, you know, Indian hawthorn. There were very few different species of plants. There was about a palette of 15 or 20 plants that they were all using. So we, we joked that we could actually sit in our office and tell them everything that was wrong with their um, plants. They were all planted too close together. They were watered too much. And we'd go out and that was what it would be. Um, so changing the the urban settings to become a little less monotonous, more, more life in there, more inspiring by having a different palette of plants. Planting a few native plants is really good, but, um, and, and the habitat loss is the leading species of, um, leading cause of species decline. So your planting choices are gonna affect the types of pollinators you get. 
and they've evolved through time with native plants. It's not to say they won't go to non-native, but a lot of times they go to the native plants first, but you can intersperse a few of the non-native plants um, as long as they're not invasive. And, and um, you don't want me to get on a soapbox about in, invasive plants because that's one of my pet peeves. But um, the plants should have exceptional qualities. If there's nothing about them, and yes, I do, I said, I'm a plant addict, so I have some plants in my yard that that don't have um, pollinator much happening with them. Those are the plants that I will get rid of first as I choose other native plants or choose other really good pollinator plants. If, if the plants that I have aren't working, then I will eventually get rid of those. But for now, I'm, I'm, I'm happy with them, but I will eventually change that. We have to create a habitat. We can't just attract pollinators. And it's most easily done with native plants, but if you put a native plant in a non-native conditions, if you don't supply the right soil and things like that, the right light for it, it it's actually acting like a non-native plant anyway. So you need to be careful with that. Our, our um, urban settings that are built up, there's soil brought in, there's sand, there's gravel, there's, there's all kinds of stuff that really it's hard to make a native habitat out of it. So now we're gonna get into the plants, which is probably what you're here for. Um, we have the, um, I, I just wanna show you this book. Um, if you're in Sarasota County or one of the Southwest Florida water management districts, um, if you're in that district, it's about 16, 14 or 16 counties, you can actually order one of these from the Southwest Florida water management district. In Sarasota County, you can come to our office and pick one up, but you can also go online at that link, which I believe is in your list that I handed out to you. But I just wanna show you this a little bit because um, it, it can tell you a real lot about plants. It's not 100% accurate, there's a few mistakes in it, but I always recommend looking at two or three sources when you're looking up at plants because there's a lot of variation in um, websites. And they, they tried to be really, really correct, but there's still some mistakes. But anyway, the key's on page 31. But as you go through this, it, it starts with large trees, small trees, large shrubs, small shrubs. And then it goes into um, flowers and um, wildflowers, perennials, a lot of different annuals, ground covers. So, but the key's on page 31. So just take this plant up here, um, camellia. Um, it grows in the north and the central part of the state. Down here at the bottom, um, second from the right, there's one that needs a south, and, and actually the one on the right needs a south too. But it tells you so what part of the state, what zone you're in. On, on um, page 31, it'll tell you what zone you're in if you're not familiar with that. But um, it tells you how much water, what pH, what uh, the rate of growth, how high and wide it gets. There's quite a bit of variation in those. Um, and then the pH and um, some of these I'm not really super familiar with, even though I've used the book for years, ever since it came out in 2010. Um, and then this blue box will be around what kind of sunlight it wants the most. This part, this particular one is partial shade. So um, if it's around, you've got one down here on the right, on the bottom right that wants full sun. And then I don't see any that want full shade. But anyway, what I really like about this book um, for attracting pollinators the butterfly, well, it attracts butterflies, but if it attracts butterflies, it's gonna attract pollinators as well. And then rather it attracts hummingbirds or songbirds. Um, and it has salt tolerance and, and quite a few other things in there, how much water it needs, things like that. But so very, very good information on that. Um, so good, good to know. And you, you can download that if you're not in one of the counties where you can get it for free. So some of the plants I've started pretty much with the larger plants, the trees. This one is one that you need to be really careful of if you have kids around because it does get these wicked recurved thorns. If you accidentally um, get into the thorns, you can't just pull out because they're curved. So you kind of have to do a wiggle dance to get out of there. Um, full to partial sun, salt and drought tolerant. It gets up to about 25 feet. Um, it gets this, this is the larval host 
of the giant swallowtail caterpillar. And this is what the caterpillar looks like. It's sometimes called um, the bird dropping caterpillar because it looks a lot like bird dropping, especially when it's younger. Um, and this is the buds on it. So these open up into little tiny flowers, which you can't even hardly tell if they're open or not. You have to kind of get a magnifying glass. It is a male and a female, and apparently mine is a, a male because I've never gotten any wild limes on it. They're real tiny, um, look like a tiny berry. But any of your citrus trees are the host to that, that particular butterfly. So if you have a key lime or an orange or anything, some of them um, with the citrus greening, I wouldn't recommend going out and buying a citrus tree at this point. I would wait until there's some kind of treatment for the citrus greening. But if you have one in your yard, you may see some of those caterpillars on it. Um, so it's a really good host and a pollinator plant as well. So Florida privet, it's a shrub that gets up to about 10 feet, full to partial sun. Um, actually, I think the ones on our campus here at Sarasota County Extension are up, are probably more like 12 feet, so it can get a little bit bigger. It's a, a pretty fast grower, drought and salt tolerant. It's, it's not listed as a pollinator attractor because it's blooming in January. And we don't have a, as many pollinators around in January. So it's, it's not listed even for butterflies, but when nothing else is blooming, the butterflies, the pollinators, they go to it. And it attracts, um, so it does attract pollinators at that time of year in, in the warmer areas. Dense cover and fruit that attracts birds and it's good for nesting because it is so dense. This is up at the Florida Botanical Gardens in um, Largo. And you can see how small those flowers are. See how big the bee is. It's completely, you can't even see the flower on it. Um, so it's, it's not the biggest part of growing it. The biggest part is just to have an informal hedge. They usually, at the time when I was working up there, they would let it grow to about 10 feet and then they would trim it down to about six feet and um, kind of keep it a little bit informal. So birds and everything could hide in there. So American Beautyberry, one of my favorite plants because these berries are so neat. And they're here in um, Sarasota County, at least in my area in Northport, the berries are just all over it right now. And I also already see the birds in there picking them out. So it's, it's pretty cool to watch. But when it's in bloom, it attracts a lot of pollinators. And then the birds later on will eat those. Um, grow six to eight feet tall in sun or shade. Um, the berries are edible for humans as well, so if you have um, kids around, that's a good thing to know. And uh, there is the white berried form, and um, it, you can make a jelly from it. I've seen it. I've never gotten to try it yet, but um, it does go dormant or semi-dormant, not completely always. In um, colder areas, it's going to go completely dormant. Sometimes in, um, when, we, when we have a really warm winter, it does maintain some of its leaves. And so the mocking, a lot, a lot of different um, birds do eat it, mockingbirds, cardinals. This cardinal was, this was through my window. So um, it just it was smeared all over its face while it was eating it. So cassia, this is a host plant for some of the um, sulfur butterflies. And you see a lot of bees on it as well. A lot of wasp, real lot of wasp on it. Upright growth form. You want to use one of the native varieties on this because there are non-native varieties and several of the non-native varieties are invasive. It turns out that the one that I have in my yard, which I will be getting rid of, but when it was sold or was given to me, I was told it was a different plant than what it is. And I just found out recently that it's, it is one of the invasive varieties. So I'm going to let it bloom one more time because it blooms in December. And then after that, I'm going to dig it out and put something else in there. So it's a larval host and nectar source, full sun to light shade. Um, and like I said, some of the non-natives are invasive. And th those two, the Chapmani and the um, Ligostrina, those are, one is about three foot tall and one gets about six feet tall. And this was in a, a landscape. And the cloudless sulfur laying eggs on it. And you can see an egg right here. And she was, she was actually coming back and laying more eggs. This is an older caterpillar and a younger caterpillar. 
and you can see over here on the pencil point that that younger caterpillar is smaller than a pencil point. So, um, and, and several of the other sulfur caterpillars do use this as a host plant. Necklace pod does prefers full sun. I've seen them in partial shade and they do okay, but full sun is a little bit better, up to about eight foot. There is a native and a non-native variety of this. The native variety or the non-native variety has a little bit fuzzier leaves and um, doesn't get quite as leggy. The native one gets a little bit more leggy but very high salt and drought tolerance. It does attract hummingbirds, butterflies, bees. You can see this bee was coming in, or I think it was actually leaving, but um, the, these seed pods, you can see why it gets called the necklace pod. Those are, the seeds are poisonous to humans. So again, with children, you don't wanna have one of those around. Wild coffee, it's a native evergreen shrub up to about eight feet. Partial to full shade. Uh, it is listed in several sources as being able to tolerate full sun, but I've never seen it do well in full sun. Oh, it, even mine gets a little bit too much sun and it, it, um, it just bleaches out. It's, it's never healthy looking in the full sun. Um, it blooms in the spring and the summer and it has berries on it later in the year. It attracts butterflies and birds, all kinds of pollinators when it's, when it's in full bloom. And it, and it actually, you will find something on it pretty much year round. This was outside my office window, not, not now, but where I had my office before. And um, you can see all that bloom on it. And it was almost, you could walk by it and you could hear the buzz from the bees and it would almost sway. There were so many bees on it. And so you, the, in, the um, birds were coming in for the insects. Later on, they were coming after the, the berries. So a lot, of, a lot of good with that one. Firebush, another one of my favorite plants. There's native and non-native of this one as well. So that's another one you wanna try to get the native if, if you're shooting for a native yard. The native one does get taller, about 15 foot tall, whereas the non-native one gets, or the, yeah, the non-native one gets about eight foot tall. The, the flowers on the non-native one are more yellowish orange, whereas this one is more reddish orange. Um, so, and, and it, it has something on it almost year round. It can freeze, but it will come back from, um, from the ground up. Actually, I've had it freeze to the ground when I was in Pinellas County. And by midsummer, it was already six feet tall again. So that's a, a good one. It does make an ec excellent screen, unless of course you get the frost, then you've got to wait for the screen again. Um, it does have edible berries. Um, they're, they're kind of fun to like make blueberry muffins. It's not gonna be quite as sweet. You need to add a little extra sugar, but still a, a fun thing to do. And this again is up in Pinellas County at the Botanical Gardens. Um, so you have the, the fire bush and you can see really tall in the back and shorter in the front. This is the wild coffee there, that, a young one. So pretty in the landscape. And this is just to show you, um, I, I've got several pictures here, which I'm just gonna show you really quick, a sulfur butterfly, Gulf Fritillarian monarch, polydamus, or um, that's one of, the, one of the, the only swallowtail that doesn't have a tail on it. And then the giant swallowtail, remember the um, butterfly that, or the, the caterpillar that looked like Bird droppings, this is what that turns into. So it's amazing the different, the transformation. And then our native butterfly, the zebra heliconia, or sometimes called zebra longwing. So all different. This three of them right there, there was probably six flying around, but I couldn't get them all in the same picture. And then of course, hummingbirds love it as well. And on um, bumblebees, you see bumblebees, you see honeybees on there, wasp on there. So it's a really good all around plant. Um, Walter's viburnum, semi-deciduous, so it does lose part of its leaves, but not all of them in the, in the fall, in the early winter. Um, there are a lot of forms available, a lot of cultivars. The, the old form got to about 15 foot tall, but a lot of the cultivars you'll see at six foot or 12 foot. Um, and it, this blooms January, February, March. So um, a, another one to good to have in the winter if you're in an area where, where you have the insects year round. It does send out suckers to produce a thicket and it's a great shelter. 
So let me pause a minute. Are there any questions so far? Yes, one well, we got two. Um, okay. Do you have any ideas to prevent ant aphid and mite farming? The ants drove off the ladybugs. Um, to prevent ants in, in mite farming. Light farming. Mite. Mite farming. Um, the ants. Oh, I see. You so you get too many mites, and you want to get rid of the ants. Um. Ants are gonna farm. Oh, I see. okay. I'm getting it now. Sorry about. I'm I'm a little slow on the uptake. I'm I'm. I don't have Alzheimer's yet. I have Halfheimer's, so it, it takes me a minute here. Um, yeah, um, ants do do quite often try to farm some of the insects, especially aphids. There's not really a way to entirely get rid of them. On, on some of them, you get some of the predatory wasps come in and they will um, work on the, the bad insects. But basically, as long as they're keeping them in a bunch, you might be able to cut off that bunch if it's not right in the middle of the plant, if it's just on the edge. Otherwise, other than going out there and, and um, picking a few off. Um, I really don't know of a way to prevent that without spraying because you don't want to spray when you're trying to get the ladybugs. But I don't think they'll entirely um, drive them off because I've had plants that I've had ants farming the insects and eventually the insects disappeared and I saw ladybugs there. So I don't think it will entirely drive them off. It might, might inhibit them some, but they're, they're going to come back. Okay, there's another one. It says, so if a plant says zone 11, does that mean it won't survive in zone 9? Yes and no. Probably not. Zone 11 is pretty warm. That's, that's like the keys probably and below the keys. Um, so if we had any kind of a frost at all, it would probably be the first plant to die. Now there are microclimates some of the plants even that are listed in zone nine, which is pretty much most of um, Sarasota County is zone, some of it's 10, I guess. But um, I've in Northport, I've had a hard frost at my house and I lost a lot of plants that normally don't get frozen in this area. So if you have a really protected area, you might be able to get that plant to survive. But in general rule of thumb, no, you, you wouldn't. Um, another question. I have a small garden. Any of the listed plants suitable for growing in pots? Um, not so far and probably not what we've covered um, unless you have large pots like this Simpson stopper and some of them would grow for two or three years in a pot even some of these larger plants but some of the smaller plants that will be coming up to um, will will grow in pots okay. And, and there's a lot of ideas online. Um, one of the native nurseries, um, Sweet Bay Nursery has, they, they do a lot of potting of natives in, in pots and, and probably on their website, they have some of those listed. So you can find ideas like that on, on a lot of those kind of um, sources. Okay, any more? Um, yes, I have a red and black ant infestation Sunday morning on the ground on the north side. So bad I could only stomp my feet to keep them away from crawling on me. Two days later, they were gone. Were they looking, harvesting something? Um, I, I'm not really big on the insects. I don't know the insects as well. That would be um, a question for Carol Wyatt Evans, our um, entomologist or she will be an entomologist. She's studying for it. Um, I would ask her um, and she, she does several webinars so maybe try to catch one of her webinars. They, they could have been harvesting something. It's, it's hard to tell for sure because without knowing for sure what kind they were I can't really tell. Okay. All right, so the Simpson stopper. This is another favorite plant, but not, not quite on the same level as beautyberry and firebush. Um, it is native, 
and I think all the the first plants that I go through are all native. I um, save the other ones for later because there's some other really cool plants, but I try to encourage people to plant as many natives as they can and then if, if you got some other plants, so I, I do the natives first um, in case I run out of time and I don't have time for the other ones, but um, the flowers to this attract the pollinators and you, you do see these white flowers are gorgeous and you'll see the whole plant covered in flowers, but you can see here where there's very, very young berries, there's fully ripe berries and there's some in between. So it does get some bloom different times during the year, but the biggest time of the bloom is in the spring, probably around April. Um, so they're going to attract the pollinators when the birds are nesting and then later on the birds are going to come in and eat the berries and you can use it as a single stem or a multi stem shrub. It's a little bit, seems to me to be slow growing. I, I haven't found mine to be very fast growing. It's highly valued for wildlife. And the berries are edible for people as well, but they're um, they're a little bit spicy. I don't particularly like them. I'd rather leave them for the birds, but um, a good all around plant. Um, it, and as it gets older, the bark peels off the stem. So that's another, another good, nice thing about it. So Flatwoods Plum, um, this one blooms in the spring. The Red Admiral is in our area in the spring this was probably like an April pitcher, and then they migrate so we don't see them for the rest of the summer. So this, you know, again, some of those plants that you want some spring bloomers so you can get, have something for the pollinators that are here then. Very attractive to the butterflies also to a lot of the different bees and whatnot. Marlberry, this is a really gorgeous plant. Um, up to about 20 feet. It says it tolerates both shade and sunny location. Mine doesn't do too well in the sun. Um, it gets sun part of the year quite a bit and it always um, fades out a lot. It's not as pretty. Um, it has edible small blackberries. It's adaptable to formal landscapes, which means it can be trimmed. I don't like to see things trimmed square or round. I don't think that's natural at all. But if you have to have some plants like that, then and this one will take that. Although you would lose some of the flowers and some of the berries off of it. So you're using the value as a wildlife plant. Um, and this is it in a landscape. You can see this is an informal landscape. Very, very pretty. Button bush. This wants to grow in a, a really wet area. So if, if you only have dry areas in your yard, this is not one that you're going to use. But it's a pollinator magnet when it's blooming. It, Unfortunately, it only blooms for about a month out of the year. Um, not, not the best, but if you have a real wet area in your yard or a pond or something, you can plant this on the bank and then, you know, you're going to have it while it's in bloom and you can enjoy it and the rest of the time you don't, don't see it. Full sun to light shade. Um, you can see it attracts butterflies and other kinds of pollinators. And this is it in an informal landscape. Again, I, a lot of my pictures this was up at the Botanical Gardens up in um, Largo. I worked up there for a number of years before I moved to um, um, Sarasota County. So some of the pictures are from there. Oh, there was something I was going to mention on that. It says it grows five to 20 feet. That's, that's a huge difference. And for years, I had never seen one more than eight or 10 feet. Um, but finally, in um, Northport, I finally, last summer, saw one that was probably close to 20 feet. So they do get taller if they're allowed to grow. And it is deciduous, so it's, it's bare a good share of the year. So it's not for everybody, but if you have a wet area, it's a good one to grow. And then we get to the hollies. There's a lot of different species of hollies. Many of them are native. I think the biggest share of them are native. Some might be cultivars, so not considered native. Um, gallberry, Ilex glabra, Dahoon holly here. Um, native shrubs, native trees are the both, and most of them can tolerate um, sun or shade. They attract all kinds of pollinators when they're in bloom. You do want to make sure if you want the berries for the birds, you want to make sure you have a female plant. Easiest way is to buy the plant when the berries are on it because otherwise um, you have to get a magnifying glass and look at the flowers and, and um, know how to tell the males and the females apart. Um, salt and drought tolerant for most of them. 
This one on the left um, was on Venice Beach here in um, Sarasota County. That was several years ago. I'm not sure it's still there, but I hope it's still there. And then this was another one up in Pinellas County um, in East Palaca Holly, which is a really, um, it was actually found in East Palaca, Florida. So most of these hollies are also cold tolerant, which is, is really good. Um, sweet acacia, which they changed the name, the Latin name, a, a few years ago. So now it's Vicellia Furnesiana. I can't pronounce all the Latin names, but um, anyways, um, this gets these really cute flowers. There's also a perfume that's made out of this. But um, what I think is really cool, and, and obviously this thorn bug is a pest, but whenever I wanted to find a thorn bug, I could always go to that plant and, and they, when I was working at a school and I could find a few. If they get really, really bad, you would have to um, cut off an area or knock them into some soapy water or something. Um, they, they could kill something this small. So because they make the, the females, which are these ones on the top, the males are there on the bottom, and then this is a young one kind of a, again, my teenager term for, for a partially growing one. Um, they, they make a slit in the bark, lay their eggs in there, and then the whole family helps guard those eggs. The young ones, the old ones, the males, the females, they all stay there around, so they're always there in a bunch. But if you have several females making slits and laying eggs, it can kill the plant. So what I, I had a plant that they were all over, and um, it was getting to the point where it was getting pretty dangerous. So what I did was cut one branch off where they were a whole bunch of them and got rid of some. There was always a few still on the plant, but not enough to endanger the plant after that. Wild sage, lantana, and volucrata. Um, one of the things, this is a lantana. There are a lot of invasive lantanas. So my recommendation is also here in this case to use the native lantanas. Um, some of them aren't as pretty. There are some that the University of Florida has developed. And some of those that they've developed are some of the very, very colorful varieties. But if you're gonna use one that's not native, make sure it says that it's sterile. Don't buy a non-sterile or a non-labeled variety because what's happening is the, the non-native ones are crossing with the native ones and we're losing our diversity. We're, we're, there's very few um, sources of the native ones where they know for sure that it hasn't been crossed. So this picture's a little blurry and these, these flowers are fairly small. Each individual flower is, is tiny and this whole flower might be the size of a nickel. So this makes it look a lot bigger than that. And these leaves are fairly small too. It does bloom all year. Mine, I have never seen it without a bloom on it. It might get a little bit thin late in the winter, but it's always had some flowers on it. And mine is um, actually about probably six feet tall. It's listed as um, getting about four feet tall, but it does get taller. The starry rosin weed, this is a really cool, um, I hate when they put weed in the name of a plant because it's a really, really cool plant. It, it starts out, you think it's scraggly, you say, oh, I don't like this plant, it's just three feet tall and it's got five flowers on it. But you trim it back a little bit and it forces it to bush out a little bit more. And then eventually you get, um, the one in the center was about four foot wide, four foot tall, four foot all the way around, um, and just gorgeous. And then you start getting, um, it might get a little scraggly where some seed heads are on it and maybe you don't want more seeds. You can take the seed heads and sprinkle them around it and make a bigger bunch. But you can then just cut those back a little bit. Take a third of the plant at a time, cut it back. And then um, a couple months later, that section will be blooming again. Then you take another third of the plant, cut that section back. And then you always have a beautiful plant if you don't like the way it starts looking as it gets older. And it attracts um, butterflies, it attracts pollinators, all kinds of bees. Very, very cool. Um, all kinds of, I think this is an Ichneumon wasp, but I'm not 100% good with my pollinators. Um, but just getting the pollen out of there 
you wouldn't want to get stung by that that's for sure it looks looks like it would not be fun but i've never seen one of them come after anybody i'm around them all the time taking pictures i get close to them and i've never never had a problem with one of those spotted bee balm horse mint monarda punctata should be just coming into bloom now in at least in sarasota county i think people in pinellas county that i've i've seen on facebook um, they've had theirs blooming already a little while. Mine um, got trimmed back, <laughs> so I don't know if it would have been blooming or not. <laughs> Somebody was has been, I, have, I had back surgery earlier in the summer and, and haven't been able to work out in the yard, so I have to be thankful that I have people come and help me. <laughs> so it a little extra helpful. Um, this one needs well-drained soil. You don't actually want to water it at all in the spring or the summer. I suppose in a severe drought, but even then it's, it probably wouldn't die. I watered mine a little bit too much um, during one of the droughts and it got really tall and lanky. I didn't water it this spring in the drought, but um, so it wasn't quite as tall and lanky, but it was falling over because it's, it's in a, a partially shaded area and it wants full sun. So you definitely want it in full sun and you do not want to water it once it's established because otherwise it just, it falls over but it's beautiful when it blooms and you can see in the lower picture there on the right that there's a couple different pollinators in there and that's one where when i'm trying to get pictures of different pollinators i can go out when that's in blue bum full bloom and get tons of pictures of pollinators just on that one plant and goldenrod's another one that's the same thing um it gets blamed for a lot of the allergies that are really caused by ragweed because they're blooming at the same time um wants full sun there's there's several different varieties some that only grow about two feet and some that grow about six foot some are more of a ground cover some are very upright all kinds of pollinators it's it's like a magnet to pollinators and most of them bloom in the fall although i have seen some that have been blooming for two or three months during the summer and this is some of the pollinators which i don't know what they all are bees and flies and wasps and Need to ask Carol what that one is. I keep forgetting. And this is in a landscape. This is here at our extension office. Most of it's been cut down because people didn't like it, I guess. But there's there's still some of it there, so we'll still have some bloom. Most of the goldenrods do spread a little bit too much. They're they're very prolific, so you do have to cut some of it back if you have a small area. You can't just let it take over and that be the only thing that's there. So that's that's something to be wary of with goldenrods. They, they spread like crazy. Um, this is ironweed. I love ironweed. It's, well, I guess I must love purple because I seem to like <laughs> some of those plants. Um, there's a giant ironweed um, and then there's a narrow leafed ironweed and then um, there's several others, but those are the two that I'm most familiar with. The other ones um, one of the guys that lives up in Holiday um, posts pictures on the native plant website and um, he has some of the other ones like New England ironweed and several others but they, they're just beautiful and they attract all kinds of butterflies all kinds of pollinators mine got gets about seven feet tall um, and usually they need a little bit of staking because they like to fall over a little bit so and then we come to the milkweeds now there's there's a lot of um, controversy over milkweeds. The the native milkweeds there's no controversy. It's the non-native ones that that have the controversy, and um, the native ones are harder to find. They're harder to grow. So I do use some of the non-native ones. A couple years ago, I bought several of the non-native ones or the native ones, and um, I. I don't have any one of them right now, so I'm going to try again. But meanwhile, I do have some of the non-native ones there. Um, but if you can and and you um, manage to keep them alive, most of the native ones go dormant. And in our area, in Sarasota County anyways, our butterflies, our monarch butterflies don't migrate. So we have butterflies year round, so we need some um, milkweed for them in the winter as well. Now, if we happen to have a really cold winter, they probably would migrate, or then unfortunately we would lose some of the caterpillars. But this is the non-native one, and it's used a lot. And I, this 
this picture of the hummingbird was through my kitchen window. I didn't even know um, that it attracted hummingbirds. And so that means probably the native one, the all orange one would be even better for attracting hummingbirds. But so the controversy is because there's some diseases associated with this one that can um, affect the monarchs. And if it's not cut down in the winter time, that they will get that. I, I'm neither, I don't know one way or the other which is true. And if I find out one way or the other, then I will, you know, if I find out they're totally horribly bad, then I will get rid of my non-native ones. But for now, um, I, I need to feed the butterflies. I need to feed the caterpillars. So tropical sage, this is another one that you want to trim a third of it at a time because this time of year has gotten very tall and very scraggly loses all its lower leaves and it doesn't really look that neat, but you trim a third of it back a couple months later, that section's growing again, then you trim another third and, and then you keep a big bushy full plant all the time. It blooms year round for the most part. If, if you're in an area where it's cold, it's gonna freeze down and then you have the new seedlings come up the next year because it does reseed heavily. Even, even in my yard, I'm pulling out dozens of the seedlings every year. Um, full sun to light shade. I think full sun is going to be a little bit better for it. It's native. It attracts all kinds of butterflies, all kinds of bees. Bumblebees love the sages, all the different kinds of sages, even the non-native ones. Um, so it's, it's a good all-around plant for a lot of different ones. And it, it the, the varieties cross. Um, it comes in red and in white and in really a really pale pink like where this bumblebee is over here on the side and they cross the red and the pink cross and then you'll get some like tangerine colors so I've got several colors in my yard which kind of surprised me but um and some of these bees this one is not actually helpful as a pollinator because it's stilling the nectar it's drilling a hole in the, the lower edge of the flower or up towards the corolla and and stealing nectar and so then it's not getting any of the pollen on it so it's not pollinating but it's still fun to watch them and you have other plants that are using them and getting spreading the pollen because they do seed heavily so um this is scorpion tail it gets probably up to four feet although often less than that i had a plant in my front yard that was about four foot by four foot i mean it was huge and normally you don't see them that big. Um, I actually cut that one down because it was taking up such a huge spot of the front yard. And now I have plenty of seedlings coming up and I've got seedlings in a few different places in the yard. And instead of letting them get that big, I keep them cut back and, and maintain them a little bit. But you see all kinds of pollinators. This is just a couple of the white tipped black moth and the um, white peacock. So, but there's all kinds of um, bees and wasps and everything on this plant as well. And the smaller, smaller butterflies, smaller flowers attract more of the smaller butterflies generally. You don't, you're not going to see the big butterfly. Occasionally you might see a big butterfly on it, but mostly the smaller ones. So beach sunflower, Hylianthus stabilis. There is a subspecies of this, one that stays really close to the ground. You can see this gets up to about three feet. The subspecies only gets up to about one foot. And I like that much, much better because it stays neater all year long, but um, you can't always find the other varieties. So you might only find this variety, but if you can find the, the short, shorter one. It, I think the other one is called East Coast and then the one's called West Coast, but some people get that mixed up too. So I'm not sure anymore which is which, but full sun is best. It's not gonna, it will grow in the shade, but it's not going to bloom as well. It's going to be more lanky and you don't, you don't want it any more lanky than it already is. It blooms almost all year round unless it freezes. If it freezes, you're going to have seedlings come back up in the place where it was. Um, it's a, a, not the best butterfly plant, but it is a fairly good pollinator plant. Um, it is native and it's very, very drought tolerant. It makes good ground cover here at our extension office. It has spread into several other beds. So that would be something you would want to watch for if you have a small area that you might have to pull seedlings out of some of the other areas. But it does occasionally attract butterflies, not, not a lot. And Tampa Vervain, 
This is one plant that I've never really had good luck with myself. I love it and it's really good pollinator plant. Um, it seems to have a tendency to get spider mites on it, but that, that usually in drier areas that that's going to happen. Um, but it, it's such a nice little small plant, only maybe a foot tall, maybe 18 inches. Um, and it, it's a nice mounding plant. And I think it's supposed to be perennial, but I think if you treat it as an annual and um, replace it every year, it's, it's probably a little bit easier to maintain. I, I might get them to live for a couple of years, but never usually longer than that. And now I'm probably on the southern end of where it'll grow anyway. Partridge pea, another plant that probably only gets about two and a half feet, um, maybe three, but it's all, most of the sulfurs like it. They use it as a native plant. And in my yard, I bought plants two different times and couldn't get them to survive. I planted some seeds and they came up, but I didn't get it to survive. And it might've been the area I put it in because all around me in the woods and the edge of the, the well, more the edge of the road because it does need sun. So along the edge, I see them growing all over the place. Um, so maybe I watered it too much, I'm not sure, but I am gonna try it again because it's a really cool, small plant. When you run out of room for big plants, you're looking for smaller plants again. This one is very weedy, but it attracts pollinators like crazy. So if you look in this picture, if you can follow my mouse, there's a pollinator there, there's one here. Of course, there's one coming in there, there's one here, there's one there. And I think there were a couple more on it, but that's all you could really see in that picture. So um, it grows in wet areas again. It will, it will um, grow in drier areas too. I have coming up in my potted plants a lot. Um, I always let one or two grow. I don't let all of them grow, but it's such a good plant. And then and another, it's another one you can, once it starts getting all this turning brown and, and at the yeah, like you can see my hand, right? When this starts turning brown and it gets really weedy looking, I cut that off and then it sends up new shoots again. And then you've got a nice new bushy plant again. Um, but I wouldn't let every single plant that grows um, come up because otherwise then you would have it running over your area. It does like moist areas the best. It will grow in dry areas, but moisture is what it likes. Um, it is called rosy camphor weed. Um, if, you, if you don't like smelly plants, you might not want this plant. To me, it stinks, but I don't, I don't go around petting it, so I have to smell it. Some of my plants I do. If I like the smell of something, I'll go and rub my hand over it so I can smell it. This is one I don't touch if I can help it. A, nice, a really good pollinator plant. So blanket flower. Um, blanket flower is a really cool plant. It, it blooms like crazy when it comes up. I made the mistake <laughs> last summer. I, I thought, well, the, none of the seeds are coming up. So I spread the seeds from the plants that I had all over the place. And then I had plants all over the place. I mean, I had this huge area, which was okay because at the time I wasn't able to get out in the yard and, and do anything. But um, Next year, I am not gonna let every single plant grow because there's too many of them and I want other plants to put in there, but it, it does, it, it can make a big area that can fill in a whole area like that. And you do get different butterflies on it um, and, and a lot of um, bees. There's several kinds of the native bees that get on it as well. Not, not the huge ones usually, but other ones. Um, false rosemary, conradina. This gets, this wasn't all in the same picture, I, um, but in about a half an hour, I got all these different pollinators on this, this plant. So smaller butterflies and then wasps and bees and flies and the big bees, several different ones. It's native and it, it, it blooms um, the biggest share of the year. It kind of, um, sometimes it'll start falling over and get real lanky. So then I just trim it back a little bit and then new growth comes up in the center and you have a nice full compact plant that way. Coral honeysuckle, full to partial sun. That's a good thing about this one is because you can have it, some people actually allow it to grow up through their trees so they can um, have the, you know, have some support for it. I've seen people grow it on the ground so it was like a ground cover. Um, generally, a trellis is probably the best because you want the hummingbirds to be able to get to it. 
Um, and it's very, very winter hardy. So if you get a frost and like say your fire bush blooms, you want something for the um, hummingbirds to have when they migrate through in the spring. In our area, they're migrating through probably in March, sometimes April. And then they migrate back through in the fall about starting in late August through September and October. So yeah, a couple different times of the years where you can see um, hummingbirds quite a bit. And it's actually still blooming now, my plant is but having it blooming in the spring when they're coming through because some of the other flowers aren't blooming yet then. So that's, that's a good thing to have. And um, cross vine, this is another native vine. And I just, this was a better picture of the nectar robbing. Um, several of the different, I call it bumblebees. They're not all considered bumblebees, but several different ones do that nectar robbing. And there's, that's it on blueberries. And blueberries have a really tiny opening, so the bumblebee couldn't even begin to get in there. And they do, um, they do get nectar from it, but they're not pollinating it at all. Um, apparently, there's several different ways that bees do pollinate plants like this, including um, vibrating their wings and making the pollen fall. But I don't know all that stuff as much. I just know it's kind of cool to see this going on. Climbing aster, this blooms in December and January. Might even start in November if it cools off early enough. So it's a pollinator magnet, all kinds of butterflies, all kinds of wasps and bees, and some of the really, really pretty bees, the um, orchid bees, the sweat bees. So it, it needs a lot of room. It likes water as well, um, but I've seen it growing in dry areas as well. Um, full sun is better. I've also seen it grow on um, banks of, um, not rivers, but like canals and areas like that, um, ditches, things like that. Passion flower, another vine. Um, there, there's a native variety, the Passiflora incarnata. Um, some people, um, the red flower form is very beautiful, but it's not recommended. The, the caterpillars will, or the butterflies will lay eggs and the caterpillars will hatch, but in a few days they die. They cannot survive on the red flowered form. So if you're trying to attract them and you're trying to have a good habitat for the butterflies, this is a host plant for both our native, our state butterfly and the Gulf fritillary. So you want to make sure you don't have the red flowered form if you're trying to attract those. And it's also a host plant for the Julia, but I think that's a South Florida plant. I've never seen, or butterfly, I've never seen one of those. This needs a lot of room. This gets very, very rampant. It can take over a huge area. Um, it spreads a lot. One, one of the jokes we always said, it may pop up anywhere. That's why it got called may pop. Um, but it, in our butterfly garden here at the extension office, it has spread over top some of the shrubs. So we do need to do some trimming out occasionally. And there's a wasp on it and these little flies. There's a, I think there was a caterpillar in the background. I can't see it right now. And this is a, a, the Gulf fritillary caterpillar. Sometimes people confuse it with the oleander caterpillar, but the oleander caterpillar is much fuzzier and then, of course, there's the pencil point again with a little tiny caterpillar that had just hatched and an egg before it hatched. The eggs turn darker just before they hatch and then after they've hatched, usually the um, caterpillar eats, most kinds of caterpillars eat, eat the empty um, egg shell. It gives it some nutrients, but they're very pale. Um, you wouldn't see all that color in it if it, if it hadn't eaten it yet. Okay, blue porter weed. Um, there's native and non-native of this, and the non-native one is invasive. So this is another one that you want to make sure you get the native variety. They stay closer to the ground. I was doing a yard recognition for a group once, and they, they had the upright ones, and they said, well, they attract hummingbirds. And I said, well, there's enough other plants that attract hummingbirds. I can't give you the recognition with this plant in your, in your garden. Um, so I don't know if they ever got rid of it. They never did call me back. So, um, and, and probably the hummingbird would still go to the, the lower growing one, but they had all kinds of hummingbird plants in there. 
so they wouldn't have needed to have the, that as a hummingbird plant. Um, the native one is very prostrate growing, probably gets up to about 18 inches, maybe sometimes two foot, but the, the non-native one is four to five feet and it's very, very aggressive. Um, the flowers open in the morning, by the afternoon they're closed. So if you're trying to get butterfly pictures, you gotta do it in the morning. It likes full sun best. It's gonna bloom better in the full sun. It's gonna be less leggy. Um, and it is, like I said, this, the smaller one is the native one. And you can see um, it does attract sometimes the bigger butterflies, not usually the tiny flowers don't usually attract bigger butterflies, but occasionally you do. And then long tailed skippers. Stokes Aster, this is, uh, mine did not survive the winter. I, well, it wasn't actually the winter that killed it. I think I had moles in my property and um, I think they, uh, they tunneled underneath it and it died. And I, I'm on the southern edge of where it grows well, but this, this attracted probably a hundred different pollen. I don't know, I, didn't, I couldn't even count them all. There were so many, but it was so fun to watch and take pictures of everything that came to it. And in the, it has a basal rosette of leaves. So it goes semi-dormant in the winter and you'll see that basal rosette, just, just um, you know, very small to the ground. And then it gets a little bit taller in the spring and then it sends up um, stalks of flowers, which maybe are a couple feet tall. Um, this, the really funny one that I really, really enjoyed watching, it attracted this skipper and there was an ambush bug waiting on it. The ambush bug got the skipper and was eating it. They sucked the juice out of it. I mean, nature, you say, oh, poor butterfly. Well, yeah, poor butterfly, but nature is a very intricate web and all this is happening whether we know it or not. And you find out more by being out there watching and seeing what's going on than, than you would by um, sitting in your house watching TV or something. So anyway, it was sucking the juice out of it. And then this wasp came and stole it. It, it took it straight away, the, the ambush bug, well, you know, you're bigger than me, you can have it. He crawled off. But an hour later, the wasp came back to see if it had caught anything else. I just thought that was, that just blew my mind that the wasp actually came back to see if it had gotten anything else. I mean, go get your own food already. And then there's just, just you know, all these butterflies and wasps, the, the um, sweat bee, just, I don't even know the names of all these. It would be fun to find out, but they, it was just a phenomenal. Look at all these different butterflies, this ignumen wasp, every single one of these. And then sometimes two or three on a flower at the same time. It was just totally amazing. And this is one of my new favorite plants. Um, it's another, a plant that w wants a wet area, so it's not for everybody. I have a swale, so I, I'm able to keep that area wet. In the summer, it stays wet. In the winter, I do water it some. That's the only irrigation that I have is in that swale, so if it dries out, I can, I can keep it wet. But um, the whole rest of my yard doesn't get water. Occasionally, in a drought, I do have to do. So this needs a wet area, but I love this powder blue color. And these flowers last like for a month. And it just had stalk after stalk after stalk and all kinds of butterflies, not all kinds, but several. And then some different, um, different other kinds of pollinators on it as well. And just, um, just a really cool looking plant. Powder puff mimosa, this is a ground cover, strictly a ground cover and usually smaller um, Pollinators not usually going to find a, a monarch on it, but this monarch was gathered and the flower is almost dead. That, that was practically wielded and it was still getting some nectar out of it. Um, very low growing. It can, uh, it can brown out in the winter in the cold areas. Um, it generally comes back. I don't know if it would die like in northern Florida or not. Again, they just remind you if you didn't put um, your county or city or state or whatever in in the um, chat, do that now, please. So just so we can keep track. We're getting a huge outreach. That's one of the benefits of this um, pandemic, if there can be a benefit, is we're learning a whole new way of doing things. And, and this has been a, a good thing that we've been able to reach twice as many people. So this does, it can be mowed, it's native. It, when it's in, um, it's, it's pretty much indestructible. Um, if you plant it and then you decide you don't want it, 
You're probably not going to be able to get it out. By pulling it out, you probably have to spray it. Um, but when it's in full bloom, it's just really, really gorgeous. Look at all that. And then it does attract the same flower. had two bees and a butterfly on it. Other kinds of bees, a fly on there. And then this other kind of um, a sulfur butterfly. So very much attractive. Um, and, and then, you know, if, if it's getting a little ratty looking, like uh, these turn brown when they're through blooming and before they die down, if you say, oh, it's getting pretty bad, I got company coming next week, mow it. By the next week, it's going to be full of bloom again. It'll look perfect for your company. It's just, it's a phenomenal plant. I think I need to get rid of that picture. I, uh, any, any more questions, Melinda? Yes, one second. There is. Okay, I noticed love bugs all on my Simpson stopper flowers this year. Is that normal? Yes, it, it is normal. Um, I've discovered through watching around here at work, especially white flowers seem to attract love bugs like crazy. And I did notice the love bugs on, on the um, Simpson stopper here and um, uh, several other plants that had white flowers at the time. So yeah, it's normal. Um, another question is- It doesn't hurt them. I'm sorry. No, that's okay. If you have existing lantana, how do you know, tell if it's one of the native ones? There's only two native ones. The, the one that I showed you earlier and then um, a pale yellow. Sometimes it's a darker yellow. Um, if it's sterile, if you're seeing any seeds on it at all, then it's not sterile. So that would be the only way to tell. Um, so sterile or native, the, there's not, there's not a, there's not a, unfortunately not a colorful variety in the native ones. So if you want a sterile one to have some of that color, if you see seeds on it, then it's not a good one. Um, that is it. Okay. So that's another picture with three different bees going to that one bloom. <laughs> My former boss, he's up in Wakula County now. He, always, he teased me about this plant. Every time, every year we taught the master gardeners, he goes, this is Wilma's favorite plant. So now everybody thinks this is my favorite plant. I do like it. It's a gorgeous ground cover. Um, some of the master gardeners, when they'd see it in their lawn, because it's a weed in lawns, they go, why do you think that's pretty? But when you see a patch of this with nothing else and those, those little tiny flower heads, it's also called, it's, it, it has like 10 different common names but it does look like a little matchstick. It's about that small. Um, and then the, the little tiny butterflies at it and the little bees and the little um, flies and everything. It's just, when you see um, a whole big, huge area of that in bloom, it's just, it's just like it's glowing. It's just, it's gorgeous. I'm sorry to those of you who don't like it. <laughs> it's funny, up in Pinellas County, I was on a site visit once and this guy had some of it growing. He had, he had um, ordered it online because he couldn't find any local. So he had gone online, found some, had it shipped in. When he got it there at his house and he takes it out, he realizes that he has it growing in his yard as a weed. I thought that was funny. Um, but yeah, it, it is a lawn weed. So if you've got to have a, a strict St. Augustine yard and you can't stand some of these beneficial plants growing in there, yeah, you're probably going to want to kill it. But um, a, a good lawn that has some weeds growing in it and some other plants growing in it is going to attract all kinds of pollinators and be much more beneficial to the environment than a lawn that you're constantly spraying and fertilizing and damaging the environment with. And I know um, a certain lawn, a certain area of lawn to um, have a dog, play, a place for your dog or a place for your kids, I'm fine with that. It's, I think that people could take five foot or 10 foot of their yard and turn it into butterfly habitat or pollinator habitat and still keep some lawn and, and not spray in the area where you're, you're keeping the, the habitat and, and still maintain both. I'm not trying to say that people have to get rid of their lawn. I still have some lawn, um, but I don't spray it or fertilize it. I just let it grow 
keep it mowed. You can't really tell that it that it's full of weeds. It still looks good. So this is a matchstick weed. It, it, it can get up to about a foot tall if you don't mow and it can get a little bit erratic looking. So I would probably mow it once a month or once every other month um, to keep it a little, a little neater looking than that. But um, it does attract a lot of different butterflies um, and a lot of different kinds of pollinators. And it's a host plant for the white peacock. And I think the butterfly will use it. Um, the white peacock is gonna use Bacopa before they'll use this. But Bacopa has to have a wet area, so if you don't have a wet area, you can plant this one. This one does like moist areas, but it also grows in dry areas. And um, this is the white peacock and its caterpillar. And um, this is a, a plant that needs a lot of moisture. And this is outside, or right next to my air conditioning. And this patch at this time was probably only five foot by four foot or thereabouts. And there were 126 caterpillars in this patch. You can, you can see all the little black dots in there. You, you can't see them all really well because it looks like it's part of the soil too, but that is how, how much they use it. I mean, it actually wiped it out and then, you know, it, it would wipe down to the ground and then it eventually came back. So um, a really good plant um, loves moisture though. So you have to have a wet area in the swale or in this case where the air conditioner runs off, works really well. Mealy grass. Now some of the mealy grasses, people don't think they're much um, for pollinators, but this plant is in bloom. That is bloom on the plant. And um, the pollinators use it, but then they also like to hide on it in the winter. They'll overwinter in it sometimes. When people cut it down and make those little boot scrapers where it's only a foot tall or something, that, that's really detrimental because the birds like to eat the seeds once it, you, you know, after it's this color, then it turns brown. Might not be quite as pretty, but we need to change our perception of what's pretty and not pretty, I think, sometimes. But the birds do eat the seeds, and there's um, winter insects that use it. And then also, um, in my yard, they, the um, longhorn bees, they're, not, they're a solitary bee, but they will group together sometimes in the evening. They roosted on it in the evenings. Um, I mean, night after night after night, they would come in here and roost on it. And then there were these other kinds, the scolid wasp, which the scolid wasp eats grubs in your yard, so they're beneficial to have around. And they would roost on a, a few branches and then, or a few leaves. The other, um, the other ones, the longhorn beetle bees, were on a different, different part. And then I would sometimes get these Lara wasps, which parasitize mole crickets. So um, in my yard, if I had any mole crickets and grubs, they would have been taken care of. This, this was when I was up in Pinellas County. I, I do get some of the same ones on some of the plants I have um, in Sarasota County, but I, I haven't had as big or as nice of a muley grass yet, because it's kind of a little bit too shady where I have it. But um, yeah, you know, you want to have it and leave it over winter so you have some of these things coming in and being able to use it. Now, Spanish needles, Biden's Alba, this is one plant I do not recommend, I think. <laughs> um, it's, it's one of the best pollinator plants there is, but they multiply like crazy. If you miss pulling some of the seedlings for one year, Last summer when I couldn't get out in my yard, I had these over six feet tall and thousand, this spring when I got out there and I started pulling seedlings, I probably pulled five or 10,000 seedlings easy of, of this plant. Um, and it's growing all over in ditch rows and in empty lots and woods and neighbor's yards. Let your neighbor have it. Don't you put it in your yard because you will have trouble getting rid of it if it seeds down. Although it does attract the pollinators. That's a zebra swallowtail. And then see all these pollinators on it? <laughs> I'm telling you the truth, it does attract them. But I still, I still wouldn't plant one in my yard. I did, I left the one the first year and that's why I had the huge problem after that. And this is fleabane. It looks a little bit like 
the um, Biden's Alba, but it, it only blooms a short period in the spring. Um, daisy flea bane, it likes dry areas, but it will grow in moist areas. Um, I always have a couple patches that come up in my yard and I mow around them for a couple of months. And, and then I actually transplanted some into an area, but I think I might've got it in too wet of an area. I'll see next spring if it comes up or not. Um, but this is soldier beetle. They actually eat aphids. They also eat pollen, so, or eat um, some of the plant, but they're more, they're gonna eat the aphids more. So if you have aphids. But this was a huge area here at the extension office. It always gets mowed over before it's through blooming, but for a while we get to enjoy it. Cut leaf cone flower. This was in a pot. So the, the person that asked earlier about potted plants, um, before I moved, when I was in Sarasota, before I moved to Northport, I had all my plants in pots. So for a while, especially when they're young, a lot of these do extremely well. This only blooms for about a month in the late summer. Um, but I, I would mix plants together because when they're young, you can mix plants together. And I even had some of the shrubs in there and so they would do well for several years, but after a while, some of the bigger plants are gonna get root bound and they're gonna start declining. But for those several years, as long as you're keeping them watered and fertilized in, in a container, you have to be a little more mindful of the care of the plants than you would in the ground. And um, purple cone flower doesn't grow in my area of Florida. I've had it, um, come back, but not really bloom again. Um, and, but you can get it and, and enjoy it for one season and then just treat it as an annual and then get it again. Now more Northern Florida and um, like Pinellas County, it grew well up there, but Sarasota County not as well. And then Aristolochia, the pipe vine. Um, there are native and non-native varieties of this. The non-native varieties are generally considered um, invasive. We have um, the Florida Exotic Pest Plant Council, but also the um, IFAS assessment of non-native plants. It's on both of those lists. Um, but there are two butterflies that use it as a host plant, but find one of the native species so you don't there, this uh, one of the butterflies right or the caterpillars right here and you can see a whole bunch of eggs down here in the center that are on they lay them on the flowers because the flowers are more tender for the caterpillars to eat and then here the, some of the eggs have already hatched out and they're actually inside of this flower part eaten inside you can see where they've made the holes in there they go inside the flower and eat first and then they'll, once the flowers are gone, then they'll start eating the leaves. But when they're tender and young, they, they like to have that tender growth. Green eyes, this is a really cool um, plant for small pollinators, a good nectar source um, for the, the smaller pollinators. I don't see a lot of butterflies on this, but um, full sun and drought tolerant. This is another one, the very first time I planted it, I watered it and it did not want the water. And the reason I watered it, because it, it would wilt. The, the flowers would wilt in the evening, so you think it needs water. Well, they just do that in the evening. I finally learned that. That one in the mountain mint that I told you earlier that I, um, it, you could overwater that one real easy and not to water it. That one wilts in the evening, and I thought, well, it needs water. Well, it didn't need water. That's just its habit. Um, and this is one, the first time I killed it. But look how big. This is probably two and a half feet across. It only gets maybe, the plant itself is only maybe a foot tall, but then of course the flowers are up there a little taller. Um, so this gets no water, maybe a real quick squirt in the drought, but um, very, very little. And it, it just, it does fine without that. Mist flower. This one um, spreads a little bit much. So it's another one, it's, it's easy enough to pull out when you get the seedlings coming up, um, a good pollinator plant. But there's also, and I just found this out, there's a non-native plant that looks very similar to this. And um, so probably because of that, I, I wouldn't plant it myself, but um, if you can contain it, then it, it might be. But this one spreads quite a bit. The other flower, the non-native one that looks very similar 
they're going to, they said probably would be added to the noxious, Florida noxious weed list, which means then it's prohibited from being planted. And then our native, native and non-native um, lumbago, both of these are non-native actually. There is a native one, but it's more viney, spreads out like crazy. The non-native ones are a little bit more bushy, but they can get pretty leggy. But it is a host plant for this Cassius blue. Um, I've never been able to find one of those caterpillars. They're so small. The butterfly itself is only um, real small, nickel size maybe. Um, and I've never been able to find a caterpillar. Even though I've watched them lay eggs, I've watched where they're at, I see and I go back and I look and look and look and I have never found a caterpillar. I've seen pictures of them, but this is the native, the native one. It's a lot more leggy. The flowers aren't in the same kind of bunches. They're more on a spike. The leaves are a little bit different, but um, a pretty plant, but it needs a, needs a trellis or a fence or a whatever so that you can contain it a little bit. Okay, this is a before and an after picture that I'm going to show you here. Um, and not everybody would be making all these changes at once. You, you would probably do some, you know, actually most people, they already have a yard and they're not changing the whole yard. If you're going to, then this is really cool. You can get rid of the grass. You can um, cover it with cardboard and smother it. You can spray it. Looks like it was sprayed here. But you, ha you have these older, older hedges up here. They're kind of blocking the house. You can't really see the house as well. So they actually did some drastic changes, put in lower hedges, lower plants that are going to stay smaller. I'm not sure, but this looks like um, Walter's Viburnum here. You have the low growing um, beech sunflower. They put a tree in here. Um, I'm not sure I would have planted that unless it's a real small tree. Um, some native uh, kunti, which is a host plant in South Florida, it's not in our area, but probably a good lot of native plants, not all of them are native, the agapanthus there, the Nile, lily of the Nile is not native, but you can see that that was a pretty big difference, especially up in the front, and, and you don't want a tree, I mean, you couldn't even look out the window and see anything in your yard with that tree right there, so to make some changes like that, it's kind of nice to have those, um, something that you can enjoy a little bit more, so um, a little bit of, um, <clears throat> this is not me. Um, a couple, uh, some of you have seen my yard before and you know I, I have one of everything because I want to see how they grow. If I have two of something, I'm like, uh, I think I need to get that rid of that one and plant something different. Because I want to um, be able to tell people about plants. So I have a variety. Um, one of my favorite speakers said that, don't be like Noah's Ark with two of everything. Have a variety, but don't overdo it. And I have overdone it, I have a variety, <laughs> um, but that's how I learn about plants. So then when I'm teaching, I, I know more about the plants, but I wouldn't recommend everybody to do a yard like mine, but um, I, would, I would suggest making some changes, even if you can do a little bit of a change, you know, do <clears throat> find a few pollinator plants. Usually it's better to group two or three of a gather, two or three of one kind together so that the plants, um, the butterflies like flying over the, the insects, you know, flying over, they see something, they know something <coughs> that they can land on, excuse me. Um, but you also want to check your surrounding areas. If you have neighbors that have, like say trees especially, you don't necessarily need to plant a tree in your yard, maybe plant a few small shrubs. You want an, an, um, a canopy, an uh, understory, and a ground cover, but if there's a big, huge canopy in your neighbor's yard, you can have the understory and the, the ground cover and, and kind of combine the uses of the two yards. You're still both going to get a lot of the, the pollinators and the insects that you want. Um, but you also need to remember to account for the mature size of the plants you choose. I studied all my plants before I put them in. The books aren't always accurate, and um, I have a lot of plants that are too close together. I measured at least eight feet between all my shrubs. Most of them I should have left 10 feet or more, but um, I can do a little bit of tr pruning and, and um, still have nice plants without having to overdo it. But 
research your plants. That's why I sent you the list because I'm telling you a lot of information in a short amount of time. And with that list, you've got the Latin name. It's best to look it up by the Latin name because then you know you're getting the exact plant that um, you want. You're not, because sometimes five different plants will have the same common name, but the Latin name, only one plant in the world can have that name. Um, and do some research. Find, you have the, um, the plant book that I told you about earlier, but, but don't just go by that. Go by two or three sources because you get a lot of variety in what they say the, the height of the plant's going to be and the width of the plant, how much water it needs. So I, I research it from several sources and then if I get different answers, I kind of take the average. Um, and that, that seems to work pretty well for me, but do research your plants. And okay, so now we're going into some of the non-native plants and we've still got 15 minutes, so I should have enough time to get through these. Um, lion's ear, this is a really cool plant. Um, the yellow butterflies, the sulfur butterflies love this. The bumblebees love this. Some of the smaller pollinators, but mainly bumblebees and sulfur butterflies. It's not a native plant, but it, gorgeous. That blooms a good share of the year. Firecracker plant, another plant that blooms a good share of the year. Hummingbirds like this. Um, I see some butterflies on it and <clears throat> some other um, pollinators, but not a ton of pollinators. Guara, whirling butterfly. There is a native one of these, um, Angustifolia. I just got a, a message that my internet connection is unstable, so hopefully I won't get knocked out. Um, if I do, we got through the biggest share of it. Anyway, so there's a native one. It's not near as pretty as these, but it's like a, a habitat for 15 or 20 different kinds of insects. It's really cool to watch, um, but it has white flowers. It's not pink and it gets much taller than these, um, and it can be very weedy looking, but you could always um, create a, a small area and let two or three of the plants grow and and watch what happens with it. It's pretty cool. And this is a, a, an anole, we call them lizards, but an anole actually eating aphids off of this plant. This boras do attract aphids quite a bit. And then another one where a couple of bees are roosting on it. And again, this is guara with the longhorn bees roosting on it. You see, they will get on different plants, but it's, it's good to let a few plants grow with some long stalks on it. Um, Panama Rose, this one blooms almost all year. It's slowed down a little bit right now. Um, my plant, probably I'll trim it back a little bit because it's getting a little bit big for the area it's in. And then by mid-October, mid it'll be blooming again and it will bloom. It's still got some bloom on it, but since it's slowed down, I'll trim it back. And from maybe mid-October to about June, July, August, it'll be full bloom. And then I'll just go through the whole thing again, do a small trimming. The smaller butterflies, especially the skippers, really like this one, the long-tailed skippers especially. And, but sometimes you do get some of the other butterflies on it. And then sweet almond bush. This one is one that smells really, really sweet. You can smell it from a long ways away. All kinds of pollinators on this plant. Um, this is a scarlet-bodied wasp moth, um, so it's a moth. It, it, does, it looks like it's something else, but it's gorgeous. Um, but it, it comes here to nectar. And the, the ichneumon, I guess, again, I, like I said, I got to look that one up. And then pentas. Pentas are one um, plant that attracts a lot of pollinators, and they're a small plant. Um, the red ones will have a tendency to get up to four foot or more but there are semi-dwarf varieties that only get um, maybe 18 inches or so, um, and they do attract pollinators pretty much most of the year. So and there's some different butterflies that are going to them. The red one seems to attract a, a lot, but you can see there's some on the white ones and the pink ones as well, and then there's lavender ones, as, so a lot of different ones. Um, some of the other salvia species, this, um, the blue salvias, this one's not native. There, there is a native blue one, but it's not as, as full as this one. But um, these attract, especially they attract bumblebees, but you can see some of the um, skippers and um, monarchs as well. Chaya, this is a, a, an edible plant, but you have to make sure you cook it if you're going to eat it. So I've never tried it. 
but it attracts all kinds of butterflies. My bush has gotten huge. I actually need to trim it. It's probably 15 foot tall by 15 foot wide. And it, it you'll see five different species of butterflies on it at the same time. It's gotten so tall that I can't take good pictures of the butterflies because they're so high for me to see. But um, so this winter it's gonna get chopped in half and it sprouts back really easy. You can take cuttings really easy. Um, so if you're in the Sarasota area and you want cuttings of it, it is a good, a good fun pollinator plant, not native though. You can come and get cuttings from me is what I'm saying. <laughs> um, you can email me and, and I will give you the information. Um, and, and again, here's some of the other butterflies. This yellow elder, I actually probably need to take this out of my list because it, a few years ago, it was plant of the year um, through Florida Nurseryman Growers and Landscapers Association, but now it has been added to the high invasive risk by the University of Florida. Um, I don't see a lot of butterflies on it. I've seen a couple, this sulfur butterfly, they like plants that they blend in with. So the yellow and the orange, you'll quite often see them on there. So a monarch at it earlier this summer. Mostly I see a real lot of bumblebees on it. Um, but again, um, it gets kind of leggy. But um, I'm gonna probably have to get rid of it in my yard because I can't have invasive or nearly invasive plants. Um, yesterday, today, and tomorrow, Brunfelsia. Really cool plant because it comes out um, this darker color and then the next day it's more of a lavender color and then the third day it's a white. That's why it's called yesterday, today, and tomorrow because it changes color each day. It attracts all kinds of pollinators um, and I didn't realize it until a couple of years ago I saw one by a house. I thought it was you know maybe a eight foot plant or something. This one was taller than the person's house and just in full bloom. It was absolutely gorgeous. Um, again, not native, but um, doesn't seem to spread or anything. And when it's blooming, it's just really gorgeous because you get all three colors of the flowers. I also saw a pretty one at Maurice Selby Botanical Garden in Sarasota. Bottle brush, another one that has just been added to the high invasion risk category. Um, my neighbor has a hedgerow of this. I've never seen any seedlings come up, but the, the way plants get added to that list are if they're invading natural areas. So probably it has been invading natural areas. There are a lot of seeds on it every year. It is related to Melaleuca, so it doesn't surprise me that it was added to the list. Um, but again, I don't have any in my yard, but I, and I, it's not a plant I would recommend because of that. But it does attract a lot of butterflies. Golden dewdrop. Years ago, this was considered native, but then after now that they can do DNA testing and all that, they say it's not a native, but they've developed some varieties that are gorgeous and they do attract a lot of bees, and butterflies, some. Fire spike, again, really good for hummingbirds. Hummingbirds love it and it comes in red. It comes in this, whatever color this is considered um, and pinks and kind of a, purplish. So several colors, but it does, it's good for butterflies. Orange plume flower, there's a couple different species of that, and that does attract butterflies, especially the sulfurs. So in summary, we wouldn't be here without the pollinators. We would have a pretty boring meals to eat. I don't even know if we could survive on, on the food that would be left. Um, we certainly wouldn't be eaten the way we do without the pollinators. There are some things that, of course, that are wind pollinated and, and pollinated in other ways, but um, the majority is, uh, you know, a good share, not the majority, but a good share of what we eat is pollinated by pollinators. Um, so um, we need to give them something to buzz about. And, and the biggest thing is reducing or eliminating your pesticide use. That's a huge problem. So if you give them uh, food, water, cover, and space, you're, you're creating that pollinator habitat. You're gonna get, get them. They will come to your yard. They will live in your yard. Um, again, that's one of those Biden's elbow that you don't want. Um, just a little bit of humor here for you all. Um, so I like it when you all are in my classroom because I can hear people laugh. I don't know if anybody's laughed at all today or not. I hope some of you are. Um, 
you'd never get me up in one of those things and you're going to turn into one. Um, okay, and all the all this information I did send to you in that um, Cool Plants for Butterflies that I sent ahead of time. If anybody didn't get it, I my, my um, email is at the top of the chat and also um, all these are in that that so you don't have to worry about copying. These are those two TED Talks. These are in that. Um, this bottom one, the 16 minute one, is the one where he has a meal on the table. The other one's just a fun um, slow motion um, hummingbird chasing bees and all that kind of stuff. But the bottom one is where he actually talks about the how important the pollinators are. And here's some other resources, some really, really good books that are recommended. Um, and these are in that list that I gave you. So we have a few minutes left for questions. So uh, Melinda, are there any more questions? Um, no, there are not. Everyone's just saying, well, Mel, you did a great job. Thank you so much. <laughs> it was informative, great talk. People are laughing. Um, oh, good. Okay. It was a great presentation. All right, thank you. Um, we will be this like i said this will get it is being recorded it will be in our on our youtube channel the youtube channel is at the top of the chat as well i'm gonna oh since we have a couple minutes and everybody's still here i'm going to share something else just to show you a few of the links oops that's oh here it is um since we have a couple minutes. Um, EDIS, which is Electronic Data Information Source, is one of our, um, where all of the University of Florida documents are. Um, you could look up anything you wanted to, like, okay, the plant I thought I had was Cassia bicapsularis. It's not that, so if, say I went to that plant, um, and this is the articles, there's seven results for this one. Sometimes you get a hundred different, um, things but if you go to like say you click on the southern trees fact sheets there's like 700 and some fact sheets in here it gives you all the trees that they've ever written an article about so you can see this is a an amazing resource electronic data information system you can just google edis and then click on electronic data information system but you have the link there in your handout so you can actually click from that handout um, UF IFAS assessments, this is where the native and or plants that are, they're assessing the plants, they're not through with all the plants, so new ones are being added. But this is where you would look up a plant to see if it's invasive or not. Um, I'm going to just look up Mexican petunia really quick because I know what that is. Oops, I got to spell it correctly. Oh, actually, I don't have to. Um, Morelia simplex. And then, so the good thing about that, since they first came out with this, you can just start typing a name and it'll bring up the links. And this is invasive, no uses. There, there are some um, varieties that they've developed that are sterile, so you can use those, but make sure again, if you buy one of these, that it's a sterile variety because otherwise it'll take over your yard. So it's really handy to look up plants in there. Um, if you, if you want to just go through the list of what they have assessed, you can go to the um, assessments and it shows you everything they've assessed. Now, all these aren't invasive. Say there's copper plant. Copper plant's not invasive, but this is everything that they're through with. And um, you will find out prohibited plants. The one thing, like if you want to go through results, this I'm going to show you this a little bit because it's a little tricky when you want to um, get into here to figure out how to look something up. So say filter results, um, whoops, I didn't put in any, any um, filter, I forgot. Hey, Wilma, well, I have a quick question by okay, Diane. Sure. She wants to know what type of camera do you use? Um, people always ask me that and it's on its last legs, but it is a Panasonic Lumix. And I just asked one of my friends who bought a new camera, and he always is really good at researching, so I'll probably get what he got. But he also got a new Panasonic, so I feel good because I copied that from him the time he got it, and he's had to replace his. 
and his was also a Panasonic AE6 something. But um, yeah, I've had really super good luck with this camera. Um, okay, so I forgot how to filter the result. Maybe you go in there first. No, that's not. Okay, I can't show you that, but you go in there, you play around a little bit. Um, two. Not sure where to start, view all assessment. There's a way to, um, oh, here, right here. No, okay, sorry, I, I can't show you that um, right at the moment, but there's a way you can find out which, if you wanna find out the prohibited plants because you definitely don't want those. You can bring up the list of, of prohibited plants and you can um, do all that. You can bring up the plants that are um, on the caution list, so you're not planting things that might become invasive. You can do that. Um, then there's a couple other really cool websites, and I'm past time. Uh, um, FloridaWildflowers.org. I want to show you this one thing real quick. Um, go under in bloom, and then on Flower Friday, they have actually gone through. They used to do every Friday for several years. They're not adding to it now they went through and put in every friday and there's like there's over 48 pages of every flower and there's six on each page and i think it's up way above 50, 48 pages but that gives you all the wildflowers and everything so if you want to know native plants you want to know wildflowers what they're good for that's a good website and then florida native plants this is an interactive website you can go here and say, so I'm gonna put in Central Florida because that's what I'm in here. Um, maybe I'm looking for flowers, so I click on that, then I go to the next page, and I only want native, so I'm gonna put yes. Maybe I'm looking for some perennials in partial shade. Um, so I'm gonna click that one, and I want drought tolerant because after all, we are trying to save water. Our soils here in Sarasota County are sandy, and I don't have to worry about salt. So I put that and that'll bring you to this list. And there's two pages of plants. And then you can click on any one of those to get more detailed information. You can add it to a list so you can print out a list. So that's a really good um, way to look up native plants or non-native depending on what you're looking at. So um, that's all I have time for, but um, there's a lot of good resources in that list that I sent you. And also you have, the names of a lot of good plants, but there's a lot more that I couldn't get to. I'd like to do an all day class on this someday. I couldn't talk that long though. So any last questions? And thank you everybody.